drug research approached the University of Minnesota Department of Theater Arts and Dance and they said that we have a challenge. One in ten people in the United States has a rare disease. Thirty percent of children with a rare disease die by the age of five. And this information is not getting out to the public. My name is Sonia Koptinets. I'm a professor of theater at the University of Minnesota. How do we tell both the meta story and the story at the same time? I've been working with Laverne Cypher to develop the project for about a year. Yep, that's lovely, and then you come back. All things are possible, yeah. We've also worked with Kevin Kling, who's an amazing storyteller and playwright. Keep me from cutting stuff because I'll get excited. <laughs> so I guess it was about a year ago, uh, Laverne gave me a call and asked if I'd be interested in working with the uh, orphan drug department at the university and doing a play on what it's like to have a rare disease, which I do. And so it was a great fit. One of the ideas they had was to tie it with a Greek play called Philoctetes um, by Sophocles. Why do we search for this Philoctetes? Philoctetes. Yeah, Philoctetes. Nope. <laughs> Philoctetes. Sorry. Philoctetes. <laughs> the Philoctetes story is about this warrior who's part of the Greek army that's sailing on to Troy to take back Helen. And uh, early on in the, the war, he gets bitten by a snake. And his cries of pain are so loud and so disturbing that Odysseus just dumps him on an island. And he's abandoned there for 10 years until a prophecy tells the Greeks that if they want to kick ass in Troy, they've got to go back and pick up Philoctetes, or at least get his magic bow that he got from Heracles. And this bow is really extraordinarily powerful. So that's that's kind of the launching point of the Philoctetes story. Let's go! first made uh, what we call now Rare 1.0 with a group of 15 students. The first week really we had a deep dive into research around rare disease. He was able to talk to us about the deep genetics of the, the reason that there are rare diseases in some ways paradoxically is the reasons that humans exist at all. All living things on Earth change and change each other and transpose on jumping around creates a change that allows um, that allows organisms to be responsive to the environment. It's generally not good for the organism. It's like changing something in your car's engine. If something's working really well, like taking something out is not generally going to be a positive step. It's, it's probably going to break it. So the same is true with proteins. They're incredibly complicated machines. And if you mess with them, you're probably going to break it, almost always. That lecture was really instructive for us, I think, as a group, to be able to understand at a deep level where this comes from. She's been instrumental in making this collaboration a success, and we are so grateful to have her here with us tonight. We had Professor Rina Kartha, who is a part of the Center for Orphan Drug Research, 
which is our producing partner. I was asked to give you some introduction about rare diseases, why they are different from the remaining other common diseases, and what are the challenges with rare diseases. We work with an amazing um, advocate for rare disease, Erica Barnes. I have a lived experience with a rare disease through my daughter, Chloe. So about 30 million Americans are affected by any particular rare condition, which is like 1 in 10. And this little lump inside of me that just like every day just kind of grew and this, this dread and this realization that there was just something really, really wrong with my daughter. I started to talk to my pediatrician and, and I, just, I just wasn't believed. I mean, that's the only way to say, which is so isolating and so, uh, so devastating as a parent. In 2013, uh, one of our uh, collaborators here at the, in Minnesota, she did a study with physicians. About 37% of the physicians reported that they had little or no training on rare diseases. One of the features that is so, so hard and so unique to the rare disease community is this diagnostic process. It's very lengthy, very traumatic journey to figure out what's wrong. They go to their pediatrician, the pediatrician might say, oh, I don't know what this is go to the next one doctor, go to the next doctor. So then finally it takes about seven or eight doctors to get them a diagnosis. So my daughter had an aggressive neurodegenerative disease. So if you think of ALS, but in a baby, that's what it was. I can't emphasize enough that I just think the system itself is just not set up in a way that these physicians can really sit with a patient and just really absorb a story and understand. They, they are not given that opportunity and that grace. In medical school, they say, if you hear bulls, think horses, not zebras. In other words, if the patient is sick, think of a common ailment like a horse, not a rare disease like a zebra. But what if all the different zebras taken together were 10% of the herd? That's substantial. I mean, how do we teach doctors to see everyone? She's become this incredible public policy advocate, um, really extraordinary at educating the general public and raising funds. She has a foundation named after her daughter. She's been supportive in so many different ways uh, in this production and early on, in the Rare 1.0 process, she convened a group of people living with rare disease or caretaking those with rare disease, and they had this extraordinary conversation with each other. Mohammed, isn't it, do I recall that epidermolysis bullosa is sometimes, there's a nickname that has to do with butterflies? Yes, it's a, uh, it's the skin of people with this disease is as fragile as the butterfly wings and so it's usually referred like the butterfly children yeah. um, because it's very very fragile it was you know kind of luckily on zoom so we were able to archive and record that and have that be a source that we can go back to a lot of us with a rare disease we don't like to go to the doctor you know we like to stay at home and fight as much as we can like me um, I have a 12 year old daughter you know and it's like, okay, my daughter looking at me and it's like I'm in a, in a lot of pain at home and I don't want to go to the doctor because of the bias or the racism that we experience because they always think the number one thing, you're addicted to the pain medication and that's not true. You know, that's not true. You know, with sickle cell disease, it is often considered an invisible disease because so much of the pain that's experienced, so much of the complications are happening internally, and there's nothing on the outside that traditional medicine is able to see to confirm that you're really feeling or going through what you're going through. Another amazing person who is part of that uh, initial group of people giving us feedback and offering us stories is Ray Blaylark. When my son first transitioned into adult care, he was writhing in pain. I mean, not just moaning, he was screaming in pain. And we final, I finally convinced him we need to go to the hospital. And the nurse that walked in um, 
you know, was moving very slowly. And then in the midst of what he was doing, turned to me who was sitting there rubbing his, rubbing my son's hand and said, so did you give this to him or did his father? It's not just a physical disease, it's a social disease. She really helped us to think about how to bring that element of systemic understanding into our storytelling. There can be an invitation into a world that then shifts. So uh, in device theater, you offer tools to the group that you're working with, do some writing exercises, show some material, and then say, go away for a few minutes together and make a proposal about how to dramatize this idea. And then they'll come back and we see it and we have some feedback and, and we kind of keep seeing this, this world of, of small proposals and then try to figure out how those speak to each other. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so perfect that we go in all high and high. Yeah. What was really wonderful about working with Kevin, with the students, is that he really stepped back to give them space to develop their ideas. What perspectives can we bring into this room to fill this out? Everybody go there with everything they have, both feet. One of the students, Josh, actually had a rare disease and he did speeches in the show from his heart, from his experience. Hi, I'm Josh. <laughs> You're gonna hear a lot of heavy stuff in the next few weeks, but you know, what I've noticed about people who I've met with either my disability or similar disabilities is, is the joy that they keep in their lives. I you know immediately, less than 24 hours old, he had a very, very serious heart problem. And that was the start of our life at one day old. And it never, ever, ever was a burden or a um, I mean, those were the far, farthest thoughts. We, we just always um, embraced each day. Josh and I, we, whatever we're, we're going through, especially at the beginning, we sang a lot, we laughed a lot. Um, it, it wasn't um, sad or depressed or um, we, we made the best of each day. He ended up creating a monologue about that experience as well as a breath piece. In, you close your eyes, out, you hold your hands. In, your body is rocking back and forth. Out, the only sound you hear is your deep heart screaming at you. In, you feel a tiny break. Out, you open your eyes. In, you squeeze back. Oh man, it was incredible. It was a remarkable experience. We did a first round of it. And then, Following that production, we moved into a phase of workshop exploration. Okay, yeah. Yes. And we workshopped the piece and we put uh, more things into it. We got another cast involved. The script took a step, Laverne and Sonia got to look at it again and take that another step. You've come together as a community and you've decided that, you know, we're excited to begin this thing. We're going to be the chorus. We got that figured out. And then Kevin took all those ideas and really worked to knit what had been more of a collage and knit it into something much more coherent. It's this hybrid, this Greek play, put together with rare disease, put together with orphan drug research. Some of the students thankfully went along with the piece and they brought that spirit of the old piece because it's an amazing spirit. I'm Corey Casper, and I'm in the cast of Rare Stories of Disease. I was part of the University of Minnesota's creative collaboration. Hi, I'm Corey. <laughs> As director, I was gifted with an extraordinary cast of actors who not only are great performers, but they're also great advisors. And so they were able to um, figure things out. We sent them off on assignments. They come back with a proposal, which is a really awesome way to work. You're really bringing your whole selves and all your creative ideas into the 
the process of creation. Through these improvisations, when does the Greek world and the modern medical world come together? And when do they mesh? And when, when do we go from humor all of a sudden plunging into the world of pain, into the world of somebody? And that's what life is like. I mean, it takes our whole lives for us to change, but when we do, it's in a moment. And that's what happens in this play. Change happens in an instant. A big discussion throughout the process was sort of, is it okay to embody stories that aren't yours, especially when you're dealing with a topic like disease? We have a scene in the show where we are taking direct quotes from people who we interviewed about their experience with rare disease they came in, were so gracious to tell their stories and be so vulnerable. And so we wanted to honor that and put their actual words in the show. She said, they asked, did you give it to him or the father? He said, she said, they said, so they're communicating these statements that we heard from those who are living with rare disease or caregivers, but not trying to fully embody them as characters. He said you were literally told it's all in your head. They said I'm an experiment. She said I only get so many energy spoons a day. Healthy people get unlimited spoons. They said we are running out of time. Said that 30 percent of children with rare diseases die before the age of five telling this story representationally even though within the cast we have someone who is the mother of someone who has a rare disease but then doing the right thing she was such a light during this process um, and was so generous with her storytelling ten years ago during healthy pregnancy and what they call an ideal of delivery she arrived with a powerful cry and a strong will. Living in the rare disease world has, has been just pretty recent for us, and we were just wrapping our heads around it. Um, my daughter has an ultra rare disease. Like puzzle pieces that seem to fit, but don't make a picture. My husband and I started to be quite involved with getting to know the researchers who are researching our daughter's gene. But we didn't know that much about the whole community of the rare diseases. We do have kind of like, like we're an island, you know, we're just like, yeah, we're just here with this thing. I felt so hopeful when I learned that, you know, there's a whole community of researchers who really care about rare diseases. Mom is someone about us, uh, we can do anything. We can deal with pain. We can even deal with hopelessness better. You know, I really felt like going into it like, okay, so this is it, and we're gonna have to fight every step of the way, and make sure that we're heard, and uh, make sure they understand what it is, and we have to educate everyone. It was really reassuring to hear that, you know, there's there's a whole organization, there's the orphan drug research, and that really care about people with rare diseases, and they're working hard to um, change things. I offer that. Uh, I'm here with you on this journey, but I'm here to learn and experience this as well. My name's Jim Cloyd. I'm a professor in pharmacy and the director for the Center for Orphan Drug Research at the University of Minnesota. What's great about Jim is that he comes in with extraordinary passion and enthusiasm. It helps everybody if we are able to tell individuals what we're doing, and they can then in turn tell us where they need help. He, after the first version, he was really uh, generous in support, but also pretty direct with the crit critical feedback and feeling like our first version didn't carry enough of a sense of hope. 
And we really took that to heart. There's a real foundation for that hope. Just remember whose words you're taking with you tonight. It is about weaving pain and hope into story. And you are speaking to a crowd of people who are here because they have a stake in that story. The cost of studying genetic alterations that result in disease, particularly rare alterations that result in rare diseases, is advancing by leaps and bounds. What is it that we could do to alter whatever that gene mutation is causing? And there are multiple ways to do that. What if we could get at the fabric, mend the stitch, cut the freight, change the story before it is lived? Work on the cause, not the cure. The foot would heal itself. You begin to see patterns and connections that you couldn't see before. Just amazing to hear when I mom just goes after the doctors, you know, you need to do something about my child's rare disease. And then within 10 years, and I'm talking about true stories, within 10 years, they find a cure, you know. The power of one, a mother, the single most powerful force in the universe. A woman by the name of Abby Myers, and son with Tourette's syndrome, company decided to stop development of the treatment. The mother said, I'm not accepting this. So she and others, mostly moms, gathered together, created a lobbying group, and through that effort, got Congress to pass the Orphan Drug Act, signed in 1983. Had it not been for her, we probably wouldn't be doing this right Patient advocacy organizations, in many ways, is the, the core of future success in diagnosing and treating individuals with rare disorders. They can lobby to have policies changed or new laws enacted to support uh, the access to care, or access to medication, or even research. Well, of course I'm the one who's gonna have to do this. It's just giving my brokenness back for the life of the world. Like, this is what you have to do. If you can. They said we can serve. We don't just need help. Well, um, since then, doctors at the University of Minnesota that we've been working with for the last 10 years, Dr. Paul Orchard did the very first gene therapy for a little girl with metachromatic leukodystrophy at the U. Her name is Celia Grace, she's four. She got gene therapy before symptom, symptom onset and we're pretty confident that it's a cure. It's, it's good to see that things actually happen. Things that people, like before they thought that that is impossible. For those of you who sometimes despair at our ability to change society, it's possible. What are you doing, girl? Odysseus! The starfish have washed up onto the land. I'm throwing them back into the ocean. But there, there are hundreds of them. You can't possibly save them all. What difference does it make? Well, it makes a difference to this one. There is hope. We have come a long way, but there is still a really long way to go. We do get it help. Effective treatments for all of these 10,000 different rare diseases. Then we have what we're calling Act Two, which is where actual medical professionals and different kind people who hold different kinds of expertises around rare disease come together in a panel and respond to what they've just encountered. I really identified with the big talks to see horses instead of zebras and. Uh, watching families go through the diagnostic odyssey of trying to find a, a diagnosis. I am the mother of three, the single mom of three actually, um, and my youngest had a very, very rare disease. I did lose Maddie just um, in May, but we had a life that was unbelievable. And I would say to you all, especially the medical professionals here, the fact that you loved her and treated 
the patient with the disease and not just the disease mm -hmm. is exactly why she made it past what they expected. They expected she wouldn't make it past three or four. In the absence of cures, and when we when we cannot cure something, we cannot fix it, we cannot change it, we can always heal and we can always grow. One of the things Philoctetes, the main character who has the rare disease, he finds someone that's on the journey with him, and that makes all the difference in the world. We heal as a group. When we heal one person, that starts a chain reaction. If you really want to find what you're looking for, put yourself in the story. I couldn't do this alone, so I had a community. My doctors here were exceptional. Ever heard of a doctor seeing karaoke in ICU? Ours did. Ours did. That's the love and what we needed to get us through. Maybe not heal, but at least to 25. It is like continuing to parent Chloe to be able to do this work. And I, I feel like I'm, you know, I, can't, I can't take her to soccer games. You know, I'll never take her for a wedding dress. These are just things that are true, but I can keep doing this work. And that's how she, she continues to be my daughter. And I continue, she's, she'll be forever my daughter. My daughter, I mean, she struggles every day. She, and I have to watch her, you know, suffer every day. She's still able to, you know, discover the world every day, find um, ways to laugh and enjoy herself and making me laugh. On the one hand, I, I never want to downplay the, the loss. Like, I don't, I don't love, I don't love how easy the hero motif can be used, right? If you said, do you want to have all the notoriety that you've gotten over the last 10 years? You know, do you want that or do you want your daughter back? Obviously, I would take my daughter back. Sometimes being an onlooker, being an observer is part of healing because you you acknowledge someone and their their journey and what they're going through. And that's, I think that's really where the power in this show is. You know, there are things on the horizons and uh, there are new studies on the horizons. And even back in Greek days, there were studies on the horizons. But uh, I think we got the Greek to be with this genetic <laughs> research. Better ways of being and being together are possible. At least we can increase that number, move the needle a little more, so that once you are aware, then you think about it. You know that that has impressed, that works the same. They're not other, they are us. Just hearing the responses from, from people who have, you know, just felt very moved and connected to the piece. And so we're just, we're just elated with what, what, the, what the play has done so far. Romeo is given its own mastery, you know, we can choose to take those pieces and build something together. This project is only possible because so many people came together and believed in it. The Center for Orphan Drug Research raised over $100,000 to allow this to happen. We're touring through the state of Minnesota as well as a town in Wisconsin and North Dakota. So there, there are just so many people who believe in the value of theater as a medium of communication around something they care so deeply about. We choose our fate. There's a web of relationships that have been built and that undergird this project. And that feels to me like we've already, we've already succeeded in some ways because we've built that team.